Well, appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. So glad to, to uh, share some time with you this afternoon. So um, I'm going to ask how many of you are currently in business? And you should have a little hand on your uh, toolbar where you can raise your hand. Good. So two of you are. All right. I then am to assume that the rest of you, obviously, are not, and that you are um, perhaps writing your first business plan. If that's the case, let's go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you is this your first business plan? Or maybe those of you that are in business, this could also be your first business plan. How many are writing a business plan for the first time, please? Good, good. Okay. Well, with that being said, we are going to talk about planning a successful business today. And obviously, as we talked about last week, um, the best planned or the most well-planned businesses are the most successful businesses. And hopefully you'll remember what that percentage is. That percentage, they say, is 30%. So it is very important that we have a successful business plan. That doesn't mean that you're going to follow it by the book and that anything's written in stone, as we have discussed, but it's very important that we get off on the right foot and that we do have a plan. You know, as entrepreneurs, we put all of those ideas that are running through our head and all we're doing in a business plan is aligning those. So again, I encourage you, don't be overwhelmed. It looks like a lot. But for the most part, there's a couple sections where you need to do some research. But basically, it is just your ideas and we're getting them focused on paper. So last week, we ended with an outline of a startup business plan. And I encourage you to go out to the SBD website site at Road State College and download that template so that you can get started on that. So I trust that you have done that. So again, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands. How many of you actually started writing your business plan since last week? Good, great, glad to see that. Okay, well, those of you who have, who have not, again, I encourage you to do so. It's not too late and you just have a little smaller time frame to get it finished. And again, I will encourage you, as you write that plan, please feel free to email it to me at any time, and I'll just be another set of eyes. I'm certainly not gonna tell you if it's a good plan or a bad plan, because it's your plan, and that's what makes it so special. But what I will do is make sure that I understand what you're trying to tell your audience, whoever that might be that's reading that, plan and then back and forth we will clarify that and get it to a complete plan so that it's ready to present to others including investors who will require it so the first thing we need to do is evaluate our business idea and again as we're talking about moving through the pandemic and co the COVID-19 hopefully we've had some um, other ideas for those existing businesses and so then we need to ask, can this be turned into a business? Can our idea be turned into a business? Is there a real need for the product or service or is it just a perceived need because it's our idea? Who will buy your product? So who is that market and how many will they buy? Obviously, depending on your product or service, that's going to vary. If you are selling, let's say automobiles, you probably are not likely to sell many if you're selling something that's disposable, like let's say cupcakes on Nelly. And then is there competition? And if so, how much competition is there? Again, I'll remind you on competition, if you are on the web, everybody becomes a competitor if you're selling products online. So how much growth potential exists for your business? 
What part of the market share can you realistic, ex realistically expect to gain? And what about your products and line expansion? And that again goes back to what can we do differently that we were doing before to get more of that market share? Can I afford to do this business now? And of course, our cash flow comes into play there and helps us make that educated decision. What's at risk? Is it just money or are there other job requirements? Many small businesses start out now as a part-time home-based job. Makes very good sense. You can continue gaining an income because as we said, oftentimes it can be nine to 12 months that you don't actually see any income from your business personally. So what's that risk and can you, afford, can you afford to take that risk? And if you decide not to do the deal, have you failed? And the answer is absolutely not. It may be the best decision you ever make. That's the other thing, a value that goes into evaluating your business idea. Once we write this business plan, We've had many clients who say, boy, this isn't what I thought. The money just isn't going to be there. And that may be the best decision you've ever made in your life because you're not putting yourself in jeopardizing your family, um, your house perhaps, or your entire lifestyle to do this business. And so in helping make some of those decisions, is this right for me? We have to look at our skills. So let's review some of your past achievements. What have you done that you have been successful about? It could be in a work position. It could be a project, your credentials, your education, your free time activities, or something you've done as a community service and taken it one step further. This is particularly very common when it comes to a nonprofit organization. So how successful were you in these positions? How successful were you in your endeavors? How well did you interact or communicate? And how did that affect your performance? How did you solve the problem or complete the project? What would you do differently, if anything? And then let's look at your business skills. Marketing, sales, financial management, and human resources are the basic four categories that go into running a business. We certainly cannot be a jack of all trades and excel in every one of these fields. However, there are people to assist us doing that, including our staff and other trained professionals. And our strengths, acknowledge our weaknesses and figure out how we can close that gap so that we are able to run a business successfully. Look at the trends. What are the trends in the market? Obviously, there's lots and lots of, of businesses downsizing, particularly with the pandemic. So many people were forced to be working at home. And one of the fears is, particularly if you're in a real estate rental business, is, wow, are these businesses able to be as at home, from home, as they were paying office space. And what's that going to look like? It's an aging population. We're all very aware of that. So how can you tweak because the aging population is becoming the largest segment in the population. So how can you tweak, tweak your product or services or add and diversify to reach that population? It's an information age. As I said, as soon as you enter the web and or social media, you're immediately at a level, different level of competition. Global interdependence. We rely very much on products from other countries as well as our export system. Fitness and health is a big buzz. We saw many of our uh, fitness centers that needed to also close during the pandemic, right? And many of them got creative and they went to online offerings. They had a pay as you go, they, you could maintain your memberships. There were lots of things they had to do in order to remain um, gaining income. 
career flexibility. Everybody likes that. The younger generation and within my office, um, we had a team meeting today and our, our supervisor asked, how are you doing working from home? And there was clearly a difference between the ages of who was very comfortable and who really liked it. And those of us who said, it's okay, but we missed that personal interaction to those that didn't like it at all um, because it was much different in their age. Ethical concerns, big hot topic that we know now. And so what are you doing to make sure that you're accommodating all ethnicities? Environmental concerns, go green, right? Recycle, very, very big. How are we accommodating those? Home-based businesses are very, very popular and can, can, will continue to be um, so, again, because of the drop shipments, because of having that career flexibility, and because of the global interdependence. Time savers for working families. If there are two parents in a home working or two family members working, people want things that are quick and easy. The world is turning so quickly, everyone is concerned about saving time so that they have more personal time. And of course, there's corporate outsourcing. A lot of things that used to be done all with one, within one organization are now being outsourced to other organizations. So how might you be able to take advantage of that? Is there something that you're doing that you could approach another company, and we call that business to business, and do some business to business and save both of you money and return to nostalgia? At my age, I look back and think, wow, I grew up with a lot of those things. I don't want them in my home again. Those are old, those are antique, including furniture decor, floor coverings, wall colors, lots of things are going, but that's a warm, comfy feeling. And so how can you help your clients feel that warm fuzzy? And customer comfort, very, very important today. After we're heading out of this pandemic, there's a lot of concern and rightly so. And so we have to be very conscious about that. What are we doing in this time to make sure that our customers are as comfortable as possible. And we're gonna go into that in a little more detail here in a minute. So I heard this morning on the news that after doing a survey, 66 of Americans, 66% 66 of Americans don't feel comfortable going to large events in public. That's pretty big. That's way more than half. So what can you do to deal with the COVID-19? Can you offer call ahead orders, website orders, curbside service, home delivery, and keep your meetings virtual? Those are things you need to consider and how can that be done? How can you still grow your business and do those things? Some of you may not have a website presence. And if that's going to enhance your business, we seriously need to discuss how you can make that happen. And fortunately, through the CARES Act, the Small Business Development Centers were granted a considerable amount of money. And so each of our respective centers has been given an additional grant so that we're able to contract with people who can help you expand that. So we're just about ready to launch that program. And one of the requirements is that you are a client of the Small Business Development Center. But with those dollars, we are going to be able to assist you in expanding your social media, building a website, or perhaps improving your website, even to include a cart to make it so your website orders are easier. So right now, I want to take a couple of minutes. And if you would each please write down on a piece of paper, what would the perfect business look like? If you could design it in an ideal business world, and we all know we're in a less than ideal world right now, but what characteristics would it have?
Well, it's not likely that you have completed all 10, but in order to complete this exercise, I would ask you to write down 10 things and then prioritize them on the right where you see the short little lines. So number them one to 10, prioritize them, one being the highest and 10 being what you feel is the least important. And again, you can do this on your own time, but it's going to be important for you as you continue to write your business plan. So let's talk about some basic fundamentals. A couple of you, I understand, are already in business, but the majority of us are not. So let me explain that there are basically six ways that you can organize a business in the state of Ohio. The first one being a sole proprietorship. It's pretty obvious, sole means one. So that is one person who owns and operates the business. The advantage is it's very or easy to organize. You basically nothing more than hang a shingle on your door and say, I'm open for business. There is less reporting, there's no double taxation, and you have freedom of action. You have no one else to discuss it with in essence. You do what you want to do. But of course, there are disadvantages, and that is that there's an unlimited amount of liability. And while you can purchase liability insurance as a sole proprietor, you and the business are as one. And typically, everything that happens to you or happens to your business happens to your business and happens to you. You're one and the same. There are very few tax benefits when it says that there's no double tax. As a sole proprietor, you only pay tax on the profit that you've made. Obviously, upon termination of the death of the owner, the business goes away because again, the business and the owner are as one. There are sometimes adverse tax consequences when you sell it. That means you've gotten this large capital gain. And if you don't reinvest it within a certain amount of time, you are then taxed rather heavily on that. And there is a limited amount of ability to raise capital. So again, it's all about you. So if you are looking for a loan larger than perhaps you're able to collateralize, that could become a difficult situation. Then there's a general partnership. A partnership obviously means two. So general partnership, there are two individuals. The advantages are there's few formalities. You can combine your resources and your talents, and there are personal tax benefits. In other words, you'll split. Instead of being sole and taking all of the tax benefits with the partnership, you'll split those. But the disadvantages are very much the same as they are with the sole proprietor because instead of just being one of you who are one and the same of the business, there are now two of you. Other than that, there is really no difference between a general partnership and a sole proprietor. The third option is a limited partnership. All that means is the difference between a general and limited partnership is perhaps you have an investor who is a partner and that investor may not be actively involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. However, there are some legalities obviously with that in writing some articles of organization, your bylaws, your operating agreements. Those all get a little more in depth because how much control are you as the uh, operating partner going to have versus the what I'll call silent partner or your limited partner. The fourth way is a limited liability company. We will also often see that abbreviated as an LLC or as an LTD, which stands for limited, um, but it's the same organization of the, the business. So the advantages to a limited liability company is that there is limited liability without limits on the management's participation. It's flexible ownership and capital structure. You can have up to 30 members in a limited liability company. 
and you can basically structure those percentages however you wish to do it among the members. So there's still no double tax. You only pay tax on the profit that's made. And those profits are obviously split up at the end of the year based on the percentages that they came in with. And there is an allocation of tax benefits among members. So there are some tax breaks because you are then becoming a, an actual company. The disadvantages are you must have approval of all members before management duties are transferred. So if you decide to sell your shares of the company, for instance, everyone else involved in the company needs to agree to that. So it just means you're playing on a little more uh, team level than if you're a sole proprietor or you're just dealing in a partnership. And then there's the C Corp. And that is limited liability to shareholders as well. It does last forever. There's more flexibility of financing through outside investors, but they also often require more in return. Um, it is a well accepted form of doing business, but it's very costly to set up. You have annual reporting requirements to the Internal Revenue Service, including annual meetings with minutes. Um, there's personal liability of the owners. And there is double taxation. So with the C-Corp, you pay taxes because of the profit you made and the company pays taxes because they also made money. And I do want to back up and say that with the limited liability company, you can purchase liability insurance in the name of the business. And so a limited liability company typically also gets its own employee identification number, which then becomes the social security number of the business, if you will. And so again, there's a layer of protection between you and the business as the private owner individual. And so if you have limited li uh, liability insurance, let's say it's for a million dollars and there happens to be a lawsuit against your business, which even though you might be doing everything right, uh, it's a crazy world we live in and we hear frequently of lawsuits that are just unbelievable. At any rate, your insurance would then kick in and cover the damages from that lawsuit before your personal assets are at stake. So that is a big advantage. Again, it puts a layer of protection between you and the business. And then there's an S Corp. And the, the advantages are bas basically the same as for the C Corp. Um, the taxes are at the individual shareholder level and not the corporate level. Um, but there is a limit of 35 shareholders and there's limited to only one class of stock and you have to use the calendar year for your bookkeeping rather than what might be a fiscal year. You basically need to become a C-Corp before you can become an S-Corp. And this is really an accounting question um, that gets pretty in depth between you and your accountant as to what the advantages are to becoming an S Corp. Whatever organizational type you choose can always be changed at a later date for a minimal fee. So if you decide to start out as a limited liability company and your corporation or your business grows quickly and you and your tax accountant assess that it's time to move into the status of a corporation, that can be done without any problem. So again, it's not written in concrete and things do change as we continue to grow. The forming an LLC, I would say that probably about 98% of our clients um, are to do choose to form a limited liability company. And it's as simple as checking the name of the availability with the Ohio Secretary of State's office, which is where you do set up and organize your LLC. You then file the original articles with the Ohio Secretary of State once you know the name is available and not being used by someone else. You apply for your employer that identification number. And if you're more than a single member LLC, so if there are two or more, then I highly recommend that you have an operating agreement between you. That is the legal and binding document because nothing is filed with the Ohio Secretary of State. 
once you get your original articles, they say, yep, this is a legitimate business in Ohio. Here you go. But let's say there's two or three of you. You're all on the same page today. This is a great business idea. We've talked about this. This is how we're going to do things. But maybe as the business grows or people's lives change, as we know they do, or someone should become incapacitated and can't hold their end of the agreement up, you have stated in there what the direction of the company is. So therefore, should any of those catastrophic events happen, it's already done legal and would stand in, the, in a, a court of law so that you know that your business is gonna be able to move forward. A bank does also require resolution to open a bank account in the name of the business. And that's just simply a template that we are, um, have available to you. And then the uh, liability insurance that I made reference to is in the name of the company. So we are here at the Small Business Development Center to help you through every step of the way. It is really quite simple. There's a $99 one-time fee um, in order to file your articles with the Ohio Secretary of State. And I say it's one time, it expires after say 10 or 12 years, then there's a minimal $20 renewal fee or something to that effect. And of course, that's changing constantly. But for all intents and purposes, once you file with that name, that name is reserved in the state of Ohio. No one can use a similar name. Therefore, again, you're initiating yourself in the case of a lawsuit. And they can say, oh, no, no, this didn't happen in Allen or Ogles or Van Wert County. This was over, you know, in, in Cuyahoga County. So it reserves your, your name um, in the state of Ohio, not nationally, because every state has their own registry. If you choose to form a corporation, it does become a little more complicated. So you'll file your articles of incorporation, you write and adopt the bylaws, you hold an organizational meeting and appoint officers. You start issuing stock, whether that again is just several members or many members, because there's no limitation on the number of members in a corporation. And then you start receiving capital based on that stock from your investors. So with that, I'm gonna pause and see if anybody has any questions. You can just type them in the chat box if you would. Nicole will field them and we'll certainly try to answer them at this time. All right, we're well, hearing none, we'll move on. So one of the very important things to, to think about um, when you are writing your business plan and are the government regulations. So what impacts your business? Again, there are different things for different types of businesses. And so it's important that you know all of the things that you need to comply with, because certainly the last thing we want to do is open our business and then, even if it's unknowingly, not be in compliance with the government because eventually it is gonna happen and they will find out and not only may it have excessive penalties and fines and interest fees um, for not complying, but could lead to jail time. And so we need to know about our personal income tax. How does our business affect that? What about the business income tax? Remember I told you in many of the organizational um, structures that you're only taxed once and that would come in a personal income tax. Is my service taxable? Most products are, there are very few products anymore that are not a taxable to the state sales tax, but services are still kind of 50-50. So if you're, 
sure that you are collecting that sales tax and paying that sales tax on a in a timely manner. Just because you have that money in your bank doesn't mean that you have the right to spend it. You are simply doing a service for the governor. It's your privilege for doing business in the state of Ohio. It's collecting the sales tax and sending it to the state of Ohio. If you own your building, there's gonna be property taxes. And what about business licensing fees? There may be a, um, if you have to collect sales tax, you will have a vendor's license fee. That's some nominal $25. Uh, there may be, if you're, let's say, a beautician or a nail supply a salon or a tanning salon, there may be very specific business licenses. And indeed, if you are food service, we know that we get into a whole nother mirage of required licenses. And so if you have employees, even if they're on a part-time basis, what is required of you for payroll tax and withholding? Where do you submit that and, and how frequently do you do it? Do I have employees or do I have independent contractors? And this is a very, very fine line that the Internal Revenue Service has gotten very particular about in the last few years. And so it's very important that you know the difference and that you are handling those um, workers in the correct manner. What are your wage and hour regulations? What about hiring? What can I and can I not ask on an application? or during an interview process? And what about the Ohio Safety and Health Association? Where does that come in? Consumer pr uh, protection regulations. What about warranties and uniform consumer credit codes? Are those important to your particular business? Commerce regulations. What can and cannot be done across states? One of the big topics now is um, all of the internet sales that have come about. If I'm operating in Ohio, but I sell a state, am I required to charge them sales tax? And there's a fine line between when you do and when you don't. And so you need to be sure that you understand those. And again, your professional licenses. Um, I think even, you know, you, you can't just go out and decide you're gonna to start to cut hair, heaven forbid, without being properly licensed. And again, it goes to some of the other um, professional facilities that we're familiar with. What about your business registration? Have you registered it? And are, are you operating according to the, the regulations within it? Zoning regulations is a big one. If you operate a home-based business, the very first thing I suggest you do is check with your local jurisdiction about what your property is zoned and what does that entail? What are the regulations? Uh, last thing I'd want to see is you get in trouble with your neighbors who may not tolerate what you're doing. And then you've got the local government fining you and coming down um, to help close your business down for you. What about bankruptcy? It used to be fairly easy. So eh, I'm going into this. If I don't make it, I'll just file bankruptcy. Well, it isn't as easy as it used to be. And a word of caution against that, it sticks with you an awful, awful long time. There seems to be some discussion that after five years, it goes away. Well, what I have been told is that is not the case. It is really no better than it ever was, which is going to be a minimum of seven and as long as 12 years before a bankruptcy will be removed from your credit report. And what about the environmental regulations? What are you doing with your disposable goods? What is being emitted in the air, if anything? If you have employees, how are they being treated in the environment? And then of course, again, leading back to the, the COVID-19, what about the personal protection equipment, the PPE? Are you furnishing that, which is required if you're open for business? And are you following the guidelines properly. And there may be many other regulations specific to your business. One of the things I suggest you do to find that out is check with the trade association. Most types of service 
or um, products will have some sort of an, a, um, an organization that will be able to provide you with this type of information. If not, again, the Small Business Development Center is a great resource for these types of information. And we're happy to work with you to find out anything you need so that we're comfortable, that you can be comfortable and doing the right things and opening your business. Excuse me. How many of you have thought about succession planning? What am I gonna do with this business when I'm either ready to retire or if something happens to me? Succession planning needs to be written into your business plan as well as your operating agreement. So you really need to ask the tough questions. Are family members capable of running this business? Do you want them to run the business for you in the event that you are not able to? Can family members work together? Or do, do any family members even want the business? Do they want to be written into my succession planning? And this is really very important to talk about with them up front. I had an example where there was a very successful business, had been in operation for 35, 40 years. Obviously, the owners were aging, and suddenly the, the male owner, the father, passed away. Well, in his succession planning, he had graciously left the business to his two sons. But unfortunately, the two sons wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. They were not located in the area and they had no desire to have that business. And so unfortunately it sold for a fraction of market value and the two brothers split the money and went on their way. But it left a very big void in the community. And basically what their parents had done for 40, 50 years and worked so hard for was gone because there was never a plan and that's the way the court handled um, the disbursement of their assets. So with the opening of a business, obviously there become risks and risks come in many forms. Um, they can come from uncertainty in the financial markets, which again, it's very, very volatile today, right? Um, project failures. So at any point in the design, development, production or sustainment life science, cycles, it could change. Legal liabilities, credit risks, accident, natural causes and disasters, which again, we're all dealing with um, with the, the pandemic, as well as a deliberate attack from an adversary or events of certain or unpredictable root cause, because nothing is for certain, we can't know. And all we can do is prepare ourselves in the best way possible. So if we are faced with any of these, uh, risks or adversarial situations that we are prepared financially to make the best of it and be able to pull up our bootstraps and move on. Again, that comes to your liability insurance. What is in there? Uh, what does that include? And so here's a little check checkup list for you. The first thing is, are my goals written, measurable, and realistic? Which comes back to what? The written business plan, exactly. And so there you go, you're closer to checking that one off. Have you communicated these goals with everyone in the business? So should you suddenly end up hospitalized, can you rely on the other people in your business to know what your plan is and to move forward? Do I understand the goals of other family members or your other employees? It's important that you work together as a team. Do I know which risks can keep me from attaining those goals? And we're gonna talk about uh, that when we're, when we're doing our SWOT analysis. Actually, we covered that last week. So what are those risks? Have you decided which risks you're comfortable managing or which ones you need outside resources? Again, sometimes it's financial. You may not be comfortable with paying that payroll tax or the sales tax. It doesn't mean, again, that you have to be everything to everybody, to every area. There are professionals there to help you. But what's going to make you more successful and lowering your risk is to recognize the difference. Your strengths 
and your weaknesses and where you might need outside help. So if you managed uh, or scheduled regular insurance checkups for health, life, casualty, property, disability, and long-term care, because remember, as the owner of a business, the buck stops with you. And so in the event that you're not able to carry it on, are you prepared for that? Again, you don't have a company who's going to be paying these things for you. It's going to be your company's responsibility. Do I have a confident relationship with my risk management advisors? Those might be your financial advisors, certainly your banker your insurance person, your accountant, all of those people are very important in managing your risk. Do I understand how much coverage I need to provide adequate cash flow for my business? So let's take again COVID, for example. Many people were not prepared for that. Recently, years ago, and Les Finley can tell me how many it was, it feels like about 10 when the floods hit Finley and Bluffton area. Many of the businesses in the Finley area had insurance for closure of business days. Now granted, it may not go for 60, 90 days, but it certainly would help to continue. In this particular pandemic, there was a very rare uh, CARES Act that was passed. And so businesses were afforded the opportunity to programs like have never happened before. That's not to say that should this COVID rear its ugly head, and unfortunately we might be faced with closing again, that doesn't mean that's going to happen again. And so I encourage you all to take a look at your insurance policies and say, wow, what is this gonna cover and for what length of period is it going to cover it? If there were a fire, you might have plenty of building insurance to cover the building, your contents and what have you. But what about that loss of business? So that's an important one, okay? Will my lender understand my overall plan for my business and help me achieve my goals? Your lender is going to minimize your risk. Your lender is not going to over lend to you to make your payments more than you need and you won't be able to keep up with them. So it's very important that this business plan, if you're going to borrow money, is shared and understood by that banker. go on to this are all your assets covered in your risk management plan as you change you upgrade you add in um, equipment or you sell it you divest don't forget to change what has happened on that insurance policy do i know what my financial records what do i need to adequately um keep those and how long do i need to keep them that's important in case of an audit do i understand the terms and conditions of my borrowing arrangements I've had lots of clients who accepted the economic injury disaster loan from the Small Business Administration, and they weren't exactly sure what their rate and term was. It's important that you know that so you know that you can keep current on a monthly basis. Do you have a personal will and when it was it last reviewed? As your assets continue to grow, you will also want to make sure that everything in your will is still as your wishes are. Does your family know where all those important documents are located? Do you have life insurance? And are the beneficiaries up to date? And what about exploring the ways of transferring assets to the next generation? There are more and more creative ways in which you can do that and save some of the tax burden on the next generation as your assets are passed on to them. And so it's very important that you talk with an attorney or your accountant, or again, we can try to help you at the SBDC about the options that you have to protect those assets from taxation. So with that, I'm gonna take another pause, take a breather and see if anybody's got any questions for us. Wow, this is a quiet group. Maybe you're all getting hungry and just want to get finished and rush to dinner, huh? All right. 
So these are all considerations um, when doing the business plan. So now let's talk about the role of planning. So first of all, we start the planning process. So we're doing that in the form of a business plan. And then we're going to take action on that. So we're gonna move forward. We're going to start implementing what we did. And then we're gonna measure the results. And those can be measured in a mirage of ways. You want to measure perhaps your sales, the, the number of sales, the amount of sales, um, were you on target for your monthly projections or, or were you not? And then you measure those and record them so that you can then compare them to your actuals. So now when we get to step five, we have real hard facts to look at. We compare our actuals versus our planned results. Not that they're gonna be 100% on, but if they're not fairly close, we need to say, wow, what happened? Okay, maybe it was because there was a drop in the economy and there was no one spending money. Or maybe it's just the opposite. I've heard many people saying right now, people are anxious to spend money. And so they want to spend it on something. So how can you increase your sales, making a poor situation and making it benefit you? But what happened? What did you forget to run that ad on Facebook this month that you had put in your advertising budget and therefore you didn't reach your target? That's step number six. We've explained the difference. And then we're going to integrate changes. Okay, and then we're going to start the whole thing over again. Now, this is not necessarily changing your business plan. Okay, this is when you're going to actually look at your month to month or your week to week. And you're going to be setting goals and going through this, this process. We already do this subconsciously every day. We are not aware of it. But every day when we get up, we actually set out a plan for the day. We implement it. At the end of the day, we look at it and say, wow, this happened or I didn't get this done or I got more than I anticipated. And we figure out why. Was it because I didn't have to cook dinner tonight? Or was it because the kids weren't home today? So we compare the actual versus the planned. We now know the difference. And then the next day, if we like the results we got today, we may not change a thing. But if we didn't, we may have to change something. And what's that going to be to make our day different? So in our business plan, there are going to be some specific terms that become important to us. And the first one is the mission statement. The mission statement is simply the organization's purpose or reason for being. It should describe your major areas of interest. What are your intended actions? There is a market need that you're going to try to satisfy and what is that? And then it's primary values, which mean what are you going to do differently? How are you going to do it? So it sets it apart from your competition. Goals are the broad statements of your achievements or accomplishments, and they further define the mission. So what are we going to do in order to fulfill our mission? And then there are strategies and objectives. And these two can become very um, confusing. There is a very fine line between them, and oftentimes they're used interchangeably. But according to Webster, who wrote that dictionary, if you recall, strategies are long-term plans or approaches that you're going to take for accomplishing the goals. And so you've listed a goal of 10,000 in sales this month. How are you going to do that? are the measurable steps established to achieve a specific strategy. So they are your targets to reach a goal in a timely manner. Maybe it's, um, you know, again, I'll go back to the social media advertising. Maybe it's running an ad every week, or maybe it's posting, posting a blog um, every week or every other day or whatever it is, whatever you feel you need to do to reach that strategy. So you're 
your goal would be $10,000 a week in sales. Your strategy would be a Facebook presence, a blog every other day, um, a 30 second TV commercial this month. And then your objectives are actually the measurables to back up those strategies. So I spend $10 on um, the Facebook ad. You know, I, I spend $1,000 on my TV ad, whatever it might be. So we're gonna start with the mission statement. And for those of you who looked at the template or have started working on your business plan, you'll see that the mission statement is very close to the top. And that's because again, that is your basis, all right? It's your purpose or reason for being. So everything else throughout the business plan should flow up, should justify, should help you fulfill your mission. So some characteristics of a good mission statement reflect the core purpose and direction of your company, embodies to the owners and your employees, what are the values that you want to protect, Trey? It's short and focused, generally 25 words or less. And I really want to stress that. We used to call this an elevator speech. So let's imagine that you walked into the elevator, the door's closing and someone says, hi, um, you've got a name badge on, what does company XYZ do? And hopefully you can recite your mission statement to them to let them know, again, the values of the owners to let them know, hey, we're a good company. These are our strong values. And it knows what you're doing and basically um, what you exist for. It doesn't mean you have to memorize 25 words if it ends up being 25 words. But again, it should be the main points that you can remember. It's not overly elaborate, and that's so you can help remember it. It stresses the uniqueness of the company. And so I want to a quote that I found that says, if you don't have a mission and don't understand the mission, then you don't really understand the problem. And that's quoting Dr. Richard Carlin, the head of the Naval Accelerator at the Office of Naval Research. And so I really firmly believe that if you don't have a mission, even a mission in life, we all do, right? Maybe it's subconsciously, but we do. And when we understand that, then we understand the problems to get there. And what we want to do to be a successful business is to alleviate as many of those problems as we can. And remember, it should be 25 words or less. And so what I suggest to you is you start out jotting down your mission statement. And don't be surprised if you end up with 30, 40 words or more. And then start digesting it, tearing it apart, okay? Um, dissect it into little pieces that say, wait a minute, is this word at really important? And how do we do that? And action words are better. So verbs are better than adverbs, okay? I'm sorry, not adverbs, then uh, yeah, you know, somebody help me. What's that word I'm looking for? So we want action words, all right? And so eventually, and it may take you four, five, six tries, but eventually you're going to get it to the point that you're like, aha, that's it. It's that aha moment. It sounds good. It feels good. And it states exactly what you have in your mind and your heart about your business. Some of the characteristics, they should be phased in terms of outcomes rather than actions. They should be measurable. So not just to say we're going to increase sales, but we're going to increase sales by how much? Is that a dollar amount or is that a percentage? They should be challenging yet realistic. Why is that? We don't want to get frustrated because we cannot meet those. We have to have those rewards somewhere along the line. So again, you, you will set your goals for perhaps 12 months, but we also need to make shorter term goals. 
so that at the end of a month or two months or a quarter, we can celebrate. We can celebrate that milestone of reaching that goal and we can celebrate with our staff or people who have helped get us there. They should be easy, medium and hard for exactly that reason. So we have those midterm celebrations. So maybe it's a quarterly basis and then maybe at the six months we have that medium one met and at the end we have the 12 month one and then we really have a celebration. So in order to remember those, oh, and they also should be communicated. Nobody knows, if nobody knows what your goals are, then nobody can strive to do that. So they can't be your best kept secret. You need to share them. And even if you are a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, they need to be shared. And again, when they're spoken out loud, they become more real. And so share them with your friends, your family members, if you don't have employees, your business advisor. I got a call the other night, um, Friday night late. One of my clients was so excited. We, she started two years ago and set her goal much higher than she ever imagined. And I encouraged her that it could be attainable because it made sense when she wrote it down on paper. And she called me to share with me that she had reached that goal in just 24 short months and she was very elated and i was just as happy for her but make sure they're communicated and so to make sure that it meets the test of smart goals they need to be specific so exact particular and detailed no vague about it right they need to be measurable quantifiable and considerable acceptable satisfactory and pleasing realistic, sensible, true, lifelike, incredible, and timely, suitable, opportune, and sensible. Again, you see that word in there, satisfactory, sensible, quantifiable. Don't say we're going to reach $10,000 in sales. When? By when? Put a deadline to it. You're going to work harder to strive to meet that goal. And so is everybody else that is in your path and along your way and involved in your business. And so after you write your goals, I want you to ask yourself, do your goals meet this test? And what I would like for you to do is jot down basically nine goals that you would like to achieve in your business in years one through three. First, let's write the hard goals. Put them out of reach or what seems to be out of reach for you right now. And then three medium goals. And then three easy goals. And remember again, the easy goals should be celebrated on a monthly or quarterly basis. The medium goals, let's use a quarter to six months. And the hard goals within that one to three years. And again, as you reach those goals, remember that planning wheel all right, you're going to continue to set new ones. So you should always be having somewhere between six and nine goals that you're trying to work towards to achieve, to help your business grow and to make it successful. Once you've done that, then I would like you to build the strategies to achieve them. So you're going to take number one, of let's say the hard goal, and you're going to place it online, goal one in your strategies. And then I would like for you to list two strategies that are going to help you achieve that goal. What is your plan? How are you going to get there? And then you'll do the same thing. You'll list goal number two, and what are the strategies? And goal number three, under hard, and what are the strategies? And then I would like for you to repeat the same thing with your medium goals and your easy goals. So you will end up with three separate pieces of paper for the three different levels of difficulty for your goals. And then we're gonna go one step further and we're gonna do the same thing taking our strategies and building our objectives. 
So we have established goal number one. We know what those strategies are. And so then what are the two objectives we're going to use to achieve our strategies, which will then help us achieve our goals, okay? So you'll have goal one, goal two, goal three for hard, medium, and easy strategy for each of them and objectives for each of them. Once you've completed this exercise, it's gonna be very easy to just jump right into that business plan and complete the goal section. We used to suggest that you also do long range goals, which would be a five to 10 year time period. But to be very honest with you, in this volatile economy and in the world as quickly as it moves today, 10 years from now is a long way out. And so we don't even ask you to go through the exercise for that. So we only want you to look at the first one to three years. And again, if you're going to be looking for any financing, the bank is looking for that business plan that's looking out one to three years. And they will also ask for cash flow projections for one to three years. So for this exercise, we're going to stick with the one to three years and complete your business plan. So again, I'm gonna pause and ask for questions. All right, then hearing none, I'm going to suggest that as you're working on your business plan this week, you complete section two, the mission, goals, and objectives. So go through the exercises that we just covered and then implement those into these particular sections, section two. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you do section three, which is the background information. That's the information about your business, whether it started with an idea, or if it was a hobby at one time and you're building it, if you used to work for someone else and want to do your own thing, whatever that might be. And in that section, be sure and include some history that includes those trends that we discussed, right? Get that background information of not just you particularly, but of the entire industry itself. And then look at the organizational matters. So how will that business be organized? Who is on your management team? What types of personnel are you gonna require? And how are you going to recruit and fill those positions if that's applicable to you? I will say anything that doesn't apply to you, don't make it up. Let's just forget it and we'll take it out of there, okay? Because again, it's your plan and not everything is going to apply to everyone, but this is a general template to get you started and one that the banks do like. So with that, again, I'm going to give you my contact information and encourage you at any time if you have any questions or concerns, or would like for me to review what you have started on that business plan, don't hesitate. I will also acknowledge that the easiest way is by, to send it by email if you could. Um, currently with us working away from campus, everything goes to a recording at my 995 number and I do return those calls, but it's just an extra step for me to do instead of reading it as it comes into my computer right away. So with that, I will have um, one more opportunity for questions. And Nicole, if you wanna unmute any mics um, and let them ask, I am happy to, to entertain them. Okay, give me just a second and I'll do that. Victoria, Victoria, go ahead, you have a question. Unmute. Victoria, you might need to unmute yourself. Oh, it went off for a second. Yeah, that was my fault. I went to unmute her. There we go. Okay, I don't have ahead. any questions at this time. Can you hear me? Yes, no questions right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Casey?
Nothing? Or Angela? They're all still muted, Nicole. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute them all. I'm sorry. Let's see the freezer. They're all, uh, everybody's allowed to talk. You just have to unmute your microphones if you have questions. 2700. Hi, Nellie. Did you have a question? Um, hi, I, not at the moment. <laughs> okay. Hello, I have a question for Kathy. Hi, Les. Hello, I have a question for Kathy. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Les. Go right ahead. So the key, from what I hear you, the first three years, the bank will want to see a plan for your first three years, correct? Yes, that is correct. Of course, the succession part is likely to exceed that. Um, but for the most part, when you're writing the goals and, and writing your plan, three years is, is good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other questions? My question was, um, when you were talking about goals and SMART, do you usually use the SMART system to make sure things are like measurable when you're writing those out? Is that what you're referencing? Correct. So again, you want to put something that makes it measurable. You don't want to say, I'm going to sell 400 pieces of clothing. Okay, that's great. But by when? Does that mean mm -hmm. like you're months, measurable one year? So it's got to be measurable so that you can say, oh, okay. I've met that goal. Otherwise, it's open ended. So we don't want them open ended. <laughs> Right. We want them to, to be measurable so you can look back and say, yes, we've achieved that goal. That's correct, Casey. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Any other okay. questions for Kathy? Well, hearing none. Again, I just encourage you to please get writing that business plan. If you have not started already, feel free to contact me and join us next week when we're going to be talking about marketing. And we will have our guest presenter, as Nicole indicated, Jessica Phillips from Now Marketing Group. And Jessica happens to be one of the contractors that we're going to use through the CARES Act um, funds that we received. And so if your business could benefit from some social media, and uh, you can justify that and, and what your goals are by doing that. We're going to be able to hook you up with Jessica and uh, get you some assistance. So until then, have a great week, everybody. You too, Katya and Nicole, and thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you, Nelly. See you next week. Thank you. Uh, you uh, too. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Les. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.